Welcome to Critical Issues, Alternative Views. I'm Ron Kramer from the Department of Sociology at Western Michigan University and happy that you're joining us today. Uh, with me are our two regular Critical Issues commentators. On my right is Regina Nelson. Uh, Regina is with the Department of Teaching, Learning, and Educational Studies at Western Michigan University. And the man of the hour on my <laughs> left here uh, is Don Cooney. Don is a professor in the School of Social Work at Western Michigan University and a Kalamazoo City Commissioner. And this is part two of <laughs> our uh, interview with Don. Uh, we thought it was uh, uh, appropriate to uh, uh, feature Don and his life and his work and uh, his, uh, as he, I think you put it, your witness to history. Because you have been a witness to uh, a lot of important history in our country, in our city. Uh, and so, uh, Part one generated some viewer comment, didn't it, Regina? It did. <laughs> so yeah, there are some people who are very interested. And we hope that you talk about this today on, you know, how you were influenced by things that happened in the '60s and how that impacts now. What we're looking at a 2023. So as we go through moving through the decades for mm -hmm. you, you'll sort of tie those things together. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, one of the things that. Uh, our, our good friend Karen Chadwick uh, wanted to know was uh, about did, did you know about the Catonsville Nine or have connections with the Catonsville Nine, the Berrigan brothers uh, at that time? I knew about the Catonsville Nine. I did not have direct contact with them, but the center that I worked out of, the Merton Buber House in New York, which was back to back with the Catholic Worker and Dorothy Day, they had close connections with them and we were doing the same kind of work. Um, but I never had direct contact with him. Okay, okay. Not till much later, right? Not till later. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's, uh, so we got as far, uh, we got you to Kalamazoo, <laughs> from, <laughs> from Philadelphia and New York back to Philadelphia, getting your PhD at Bryn Mawr, uh, doing your street work in Philadelphia. Oh, uh, yeah, that was one other question Karen had for you. After you left the priesthood, was it different doing your street work when you weren't wearing the collar anymore? Oh yeah, way different. Yeah, um, you know, if I'm wearing my collar and there's the police come, and I walk out with my collar on, that changes the whole atmosphere. Mm -hmm. That changes the whole thing. Um, we were doing a, a demonstration in New York against the, uh, the development of nuclear weapons. and. Um, they asked me to come and say mass on the street. So I did, and um, they were picketing and they were doing all kinds of stuff, and the police came, and they saw me there saying mass, and they just walked away. They didn't do anything at all. So it made a difference. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if a guy was applying for conscientious objector, he had to get his approved by his draft board. So I would come with my collar and all and yeah, say, I had been yeah. working with this guy and he's really sincere and everything. Mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it made a difference. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so from Philadelphia, you end up in Kalamazoo. You're only going to stay here for one short year and then somehow <laughs> it stretches out into 40 plus years. Um, and uh, last time I think we finished up by talking about the South African right. uh, Solidarity Organization and the uh, divestment issue at Western right. Michigan University which ended up being a successful campaign. Um, let's turn our attention now to uh, Jamaica. I know you had some involvement with uh, some issues in Jamaica. You got to meet Michael Manley at one point, I think you said. Yeah. So uh, what do you remember about Jamaica? So when I was coming out here from Philadelphia, so I worked a lot with the Quakers in Philadelphia, and they said, oh, listen, we got a, a satellite office in Grand Rapids. And there's a guy out there named Mark Kane. You got to connect with him. So um, I did. When I came out here, I connect with Mark Kane, and then he began to plan the rest of my life for me. <laughs> as soon as I met him, <laughs> next thing I knew, he took me to Cuba. I spent time in just like a week, ten days, fifteen days, something like that, in Cuba, learning all about what was going on there, and that was really interesting to me and humbling. And then he said, "You know what?" Um, Jamaica is where things are hot. Michael Manley, the prime minister, is really trying to organize underdeveloped countries into a coalition and to um, advocate for a new international economic order. 
So you need to be a part of that. We need to be a part of that. So I have a contact with some social workers down there. They're older now, they're retired. So you have to go to Jamaica and, and meet these people and um, let's see where that goes. So I did. I went down there and there, were, um, there was a woman named Sybil Francis. She was in her mid-60s by then. She had done an awful lot there and she was wonderful. And um, there was another woman named Winnie Hewitt that was a little older than her. And they had both been social workers there. So um, I worked with them and we, we, for two summers, I brought social work students from Western School of Social Work down to Jamaica. And what we did was we lived in Kingston. Kingston was very, very poor, uh, a lot of violence there. But we lived on the campus of the University of West Indies. Um, and we had young people from all over the Caribbean that were going there. We lived in dorms there. And um, what the plan was that these students would hook up with, a, each of them would hook up with a social worker that was down there and work with them in what they were doing. And we would also uh, go around and um, talk to the people like, some people from the University of West Indies that were teaching economics and, and how the international economic system was structured, and people in the community that were organizing around different things. And um, the University of West Indies wasn't far from where uh, Bob Marley lived. So I was running at that time, and every morning I would go out and run, and I'd run past his house. And in his yard, they would have all tents with all the Rastafarians out there, you know. And I got to know a couple of those guys. And I got to know one guy that was really a great guy, and he came and spoke with our people. Um, so um, a couple years later, when I was taking a group down there, when we landed in Miami on our way to Jamaica, I saw in the paper that um, Bob Marley had died. And I was, wow, I felt really bad. So I said, well, I'm going to go to his funeral. And they said, you can't go to his funeral. How are you going to get this? <laughs> so I said, no, I'm going to go. So they had his funeral in the National Stadium. And um, so I went like two and a half hours early and just walked in the stadium. Anybody could come in. And I was in the stadium, and I was just up in the balcony, and I was right next to a, 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 a woman who had two of her little kids there, real poor. And it was the most colorful thing I ever saw in my life. Um, they had the, the different groups up there. The whalers were up there and other groups. And they were singing and doing their things. The prime minister, Michael Manley, was there. And his chief opponent, Edward Siaga, who would later be the prime minister, was there. And um, they were playing their music and everything. And then all of a sudden, um, they played redemption songs. And everybody in the stands stood up, and everybody sang all the words. Wow. Mm. And there wasn't anybody, including me, that wasn't crying. Mm -hmm. It was every time I hear that now, wow. I can't mm -hmm. forget about that. Very right. powerful. Yeah, it was very powerful. Wow. So um, one day, um, um, uh, Sybil Francis said to me, listen, I have an appointment with you to go see Michael Manley. So I went and visited him in his house. I had about an hour and a half with him. And I wasn't smart enough to know the right questions to ask him. But I did know some different things. And we talked about, um, he had just lost the election. And, and we talked about uh, his, vi his vision and what he wanted to see and how the system was structured and how it was so um, tilted against any countries that were trying to develop. And, and, and uh, I was able to get him to come here. And he did come here when he spoke at Western and Mark took, Mark Kane took him all around um, Grand Rapids and, and things like that. So after Manley um, lost the election, um, Edward Siaga became the prime minister. And the first thing he did was have uh, breakfast with Ronald Reagan. And so I knew that there's no sense coming down here anymore. And uh, that's when I got interested in Central America. Um, some of my friends had been doing things in El Salvador. And they, they, uh, they began to talk to me about that. And there was a, 
interest in the community among people. Henry Cohen from Kalamazoo yeah. College, yeah. he was very interested in this. And so we, um, we started an organization called CISPIS, uh, Communities in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador. Mm -hmm. And we would meet every single week. And they were great, Henry and other people. And we were very much linked to the people in El Salvador and the movements in El Salvador. And, and what could we do down there? And then um, um, I, I started getting interested in Nicaragua. And it was right around that time that um, Reagan had bombed the harbor in, in Nicaragua. And so some of us decided, well, we have to go. We got to go to Nicaragua. So we organized a trip um, from here. We took about 12 people and we went down to Nicaragua. We made a contact with some religious groups down there that were working with the revolution. And that was about 1981, I believe, or 82. I can't remember exactly. But the, the revolution had triumphed in 1979. By 1981, um, they had instituted a literacy campaign, which the United Nations, UNESCO, said was the most successful literacy campaign in the history of the world. These are the Sandinistas. The Sandinistas. And um, at the same time, they had started a health care program, whereas before there was no health care program except for the wealthy in Nicaragua. And so we, we were there in the schools. They were having three sessions a day. In the morning, the little kids came. In the afternoon, the older kids. And in the evening, the adults. And it was so exciting to see all that going on, all those different things. So. Um, I fell in love with Nicaragua right away. And it was so humbling to see these people. And so then I, next year I brought some students down and, and I kept doing that for about six times. And I, I would go down there every chance I had uh, and spend time down there. And what I would try to do when I went down was bring medical supplies. Um, and, you know, I would get boxes of people made contacts for me. And they said, we're going to meet you at the airport. We're going to give you boxes of medical supplies. And you got to get them down there. OK. But how, how am I going to get these on a plane? I would go around and ask people, would you take a box? Would you take a box? Would you take a box? And we'd get them on a plane and get everything down there. Couldn't do that today. No, yeah. <laughs> you couldn't do that today. So. I remember going to a hospital, and one of the things we had in, in the medical supplies were syringes. And the doctor at the hospital said, thank you so much. We don't have any of these. No syringes in the hospital. Thanks. And we would bring down clothes. And um, I, by now, I had made contact with some of the social workers down there. And we would go to a lot. And kids would come out and didn't have any shoes. And we would have shoes, and they would fit them to the shoes that they could take, you know? It was really great. Um, a lot of wonderful things were happening. And then um, I decided that um, I wanted to go down there and live there for a while. So I volunteered uh, to, to live at a house down there with international volunteers. My roommate was a, a psychologist from Cuba. And that was great. He taught me a lot. Um, I hooked up with a, a group of young people in their early 20s who were community organizers. And they were working with street kids. And um, so they were wonderful to me. They just brought me in. My Spanish was horrible. But I had gone to Guatemala to study Spanish. It didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't very good at it. Um, but these guys, they, they there are a couple different things that they did. One was um, there was a, a market where about a thousand women would come with, and they set up a little table and they sell fruits or stuff, that, vegetables mm -hmm. from the thing. Mm -hmm. They would bring their little kids there and put them in a basket and hold on to them while they were mm -hmm. doing all this. So these guys that I was working with, they raised money and built a daycare center wow. for these kids. 
but they had no staff. So we would take turns watching these kids. <laughs> and they throw me in there with 40 little kids up to about six years old and a couple of balls. And I'm taking care of these kids. <laughs> I was so exhausted after about three hours of doing that, man. I, I can just see you chasing around. Exactly. <laughs> so, so we did that. But one of the other big things we did was right near the market, there was a, uh, when the people's food routed, they would throw them into this big ditch right outside the market. It was horrible. But every night, people would come and take food out Pick of the out, yeah. and, and, and eat out of that. Hmm. And we decided that we were going to get that ditch out of there, that that was terrible. And the people in the neighborhood wanted it out of there. So we organized against the Sandinistas <laughs> um, <laughs> to clean up that thing. And we were eventually able to do that and, and, and got it out of there. Um, every Friday night, um, there used to be a rally um, against, because America was back in the, uh, the Contras at the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, they would do a rally and I would mm -hmm. go to the rally and oftentimes at the rally, they would ask me to speak in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> and my Spanish was terrible and they loved it. They loved that my Spanish mm -hmm. was terrible. The gringo, man, he's trying, he's <laughs> trying out there, you know, and that was great. Um, so we, we did a lot of stuff there. It was so humbling to live there and um, be with these people who had nothing but worked so hard and had such a sense of solidarity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that was really great. A lot of Americans came down there to live. And every Thursday morning, we would do a rally, Americans, at the American Embassy. Uh, and they would videotape us. They would be up on the roof taping us down there. And um, so um, we did speak against American policy there, and, and that was really helpful to the people. So when I would bring students down, we would go from place to place and um, meet with the people who were doing the, the rebuilding the community. And that, and that was just great for our students, and that mm -hmm. was great for us too. So, yeah, I, that, that was a wonderful experience down there. And it's so disappointing what's happening now in Nicaragua, how um, President Ortega has just turned away from all that the Sandinistas stood for. At that time. At that time, yeah. yeah it was really painful. I, I don't, mm -hmm. And again, people probably don't remember how controversial these issues were in the early 80s during yes. the Reagan, first term of the Reagan administration. Yeah, uh, yeah, El Salvador and Nicaragua, and of course, this is where the the Iran Contra scandal came from because right. the Reagan administration sold arms to Iran to use the money to secretly slip it over to That's the right. Contras, which had been banned by the Boland Amendment exactly. in Congress. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, there were lots of controversies and lots of issues raging yeah. around Central America yeah. at that time, and you were there in the thick of it. Um, did you have any follow-ups on Central America? Or? No, I mean, I am um, listening to you and how effective you are with community organizing and working with people um, on the ground. Um, but then it sort of evolves into you wanting to change policy. So yeah. did you have any impact on policy changes when you were there? Um, you know, it, it was really humbling <laughs> because I wasn't doing the organizing. These other mm -hmm. guys were doing the organizing and were letting me help them out. As far as policy goes, what, what, I wasn't in a position to change policy. What we tried to do was strengthen the organizations that were working to change policy. Mm -hmm. We linked up with the church groups. We linked up with, um, every Sunday, um, I used to go to mass in a, a, a church which was, where the pastor was a revolutionary. Behind the altar, was a picture of Christ rising from the dead, dressed in a Sandinista uniform, <laughs> and it was packed. It was packed, wow. and and we did everything we could to support him and to support the, uh, those people. And then when we come back, we would try as much as we could to mobilize. I went to Fred Upton with a lot of these things, and he was surprisingly receptive mm. and supportive as much as he could be, because. Um, 
Otherwise, they were going to completely cut them out. So our strategy was, hey, this is their country. They're the ones that are doing the changes. What we can do is come back here and, and try to advocate for changes here. Yeah. Um, I, 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 when I was organizing, I don't know if I said this last time, but when I was organizing around um, South Africa, um, I had wanted, at one point we had brought in a labor organizer to speak here, and um, he was really inspirational. I was single at the time. I said, I want to go back with you. He said, my brother, you, we don't need you to liberate us. We will liberate ourselves, but you are in the belly of the beast. We need you here to advocate for the changes that are. We need you to remove the obstacles to our liberation. And that's kind of the theme that we worked on. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, speaking of foreign travels, let's complete the, uh, trip, the uh, uh, issues here because then you went to Palestine and uh, so tell us about the Palestine trip and I know that there were some uh, issues that arose during that trip as well right <laughs> that was so funny um, of course I had just come back from Nicaragua and it was the beginning of the year and um, I I was trying to get myself back into here it was hard it was always hard to come back to this country I I remember coming back from Jamaica one time after being down there for a week, and um, not a week, a month, and then coming up to a Meyer store and um, getting into my car, ready to go into the store, and I burst into tears. Because I thought about, I can go in there and I can get any damn thing I want. Mm -hmm. And one of my friends back there in Jamaica, they're lucky if they get anything to eat tonight. Mm -hmm. And it just hit me really hard. So I was trying to re relocate back here and get my mind back in here. And I got a call one day from a fella who was a Palestinian. And he said, listen, there is a, um, a town in Palestine called Beit Zahor. And the Israeli army has formed a, uh, a I don't know what you call it, a blockade around the town, and they're not letting anybody in or out. And they want American activists to come down there and try to break that siege. I thought, well, man, I got to do this. I said, okay, so what are you thinking about, Thanksgiving? He said, no, next week. <laughs> I thought, oh, man. So I thought, I can't go to the director. It was Phil, Phil Kramer at the time. I just got him to let me back from Nicaragua. I can't go back to him and say, now I'm going to Palestine. So I just won't tell him. And I guess somebody cover my classes. <laughs> well, that proved to be a mistake. But it was okay. Uh, so you, you had some of your people went on up. Brian? Brian Smith was, yeah. Yeah, and a couple of other people. So like, there were like 100 of us from all over the United States that got on planes and, and went to Palestine. Don Van Hoven Don. was with us. <laughs> and so um, we met with the people there and we tried to find out how can we break the siege? How can we do this and all? So we came up, they came up with a strategy and the strategy was um, we're gonna go into the town and we're gonna organize a march through the town with religious leaders leading, carrying the cross. So, okay, so that's what we did. So, we got in the middle of the town and there were these religious leaders and there were hundreds of Palestinians that were getting in the march. So we marched and as we marched, um, Israeli soldiers uh, were following us. And we came into the center of the town and the Israeli soldiers that were, as a, and as we walked into the center of the town, up on the roof were Israeli soldiers with guns pointing mm -hmm. down on us. Now there were a couple hundred people in this march. And as we walked into the town, we noticed that at the, the, the town, the center had like two entrances down this end. And, and as, as it came down this end, there were Israeli soldiers coming this way. So we walked in and 
we'd stop there and we were singing and in the middle of the town uh, they lifted up a Palestinian kid and he raised the Palestinian flag in the middle of the town, in the middle of the club. And at that point, the soldiers all moved in and the Palestinian people scattered. Mm. And the soldiers came behind us and before us, right in the middle, and there were about 12 of us that stood there and we weren't gonna move. We were hoping they would arrest us because then we get some prestige, get it in the papers and get all that. Um, so I went up and talked to one of the soldiers and said, what, these people aren't doing anything. Why don't, why, we just have to do it. He didn't want to talk to me. He didn't want anything to do. So I just get back in line. And then we knelt down. And then two Palestinian women came over and knelt next to me. And I said, you should go because they're not going to hurt us. They might hurt you. Yeah. And they said, no, you stay, we stay. I said, okay. So we started to sing, uh, We Shall Overcome. And as we started to sing, I saw one of the soldiers reach for his tear gas. And we took handkerchiefs, put them over our mouths. And we thought, we'll be tear gas. But then the guy that was in charge, the, the officer in charge, went over and he said, no, don't. So they came over, picked us up bodily, threw us into the crowd. They didn't do anything else. So that broke the siege. They stopped the siege. So we stayed a few more days and we kind of documented human rights violations that we saw there. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to get a meeting with the American consul. They had two consuls in, in, in Israel. One was in Jerusalem and one was in um, the, the West Bank. So we met with him, his, his name, I can't think of his name right now, but he was a wonderful guy. Anyhow, we came in with our list. We said, okay, look, here's what we saw. All these human rights violations, all these things. And I think that he was going to say to me, yeah, no, you, you don't understand. Let me explain. And he, everyone we were going through, he said, yeah, yeah. I finally said, wait a minute. If all these things are true, and these are human rights violations, how come we're giving these people five million dollars and five billion dollars a year? He said, because there's no constituency in the United States trying to stop it. He says, your argument's not with me. Your argument's back in the United States. You've got to press Congress to change. His name was Wilcox. Um, and so that was another lesson for me, mm -hmm. that my job is back there trying mm -hmm. to lobby with that. So when we were leaving, <laughs> this was funny. Um, when we were leaving at the airport, um, they, um, they stopped us at the airport trying to leave. And they interrogated us. And we didn't say anything. We weren't saying nothing. They wouldn't know who we were working with. Either. We said, well, what? no, we don't take any of that stuff. But Van Hoven, Van Hoven gave him a tough time. So they wouldn't let him get on a plane. <laughs> So that was a big mistake because they, they put him in a hotel and he ordered room service for all the richest stuff that was on the menu and left them with the bill, you know. Uh, so when I got back, I, I called Howard Wolpe's office and said, listen, Van Hoven's over there, you got to do something. And he did. He, he made us some inquiries and they let Van Hoven come back the next day. So that's what we did. All right, so we're, we're back to Kalamazoo now. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of things I want to talk about, but let's, let's move to the city commission. Yeah. So, because I think we want to, and I know Regina's got some, some questions for you about to how, how you got started with the city commission and some exactly. of the issues. Right? Yeah, because you're noticing that the best way to affect change is to look at local now. And so what was your motivation for getting into politics in Kalamazoo? Um, I wanted to change policy and um, I was at a meeting with a group of religious leaders who were trying to work in Kalamazoo and then the city commission election was coming up and they said there's no candidate that's running for the city commission who's going to say anything about social justice. Mm. We should run a candidate. 
and we all say, yes. <laughs> and then they said, somebody should run. Somebody, somebody should, should run. run. And they said, well, I can't. Oh, I can't. <laughs> and it can't be that. How about you? <laughs> I said, well, my wife by now had been married. And, and my wife <laughs> would kill me, I said, but it'll only be six weeks and I won't win. I'll just talk about social justice. So I came home and I told Kathy, I said, Kath, look, I'm going to run for the commission and I won't win. And she said, yeah, right, okay. So um, I made a mistake. Well, it wasn't a mistake. John, what's John's last name? I can't even think of his last name. I got a, a, a manager, a campaign manager, who uh, knew what he was doing. And before I knew it, he <laughs> had me on television and talking in the community and um, people started to say, yeah, yeah, that's right. And I ended up getting the last seat by about 60 votes. Wow. So I was elected to the commission. And um, at that time, we were doing a living wage campaign mm -hmm. in the city. So I would go down for the rallies before the meeting and carry my sign and then go up and sit <laughs> up there for the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and, Al Heilman was on the commission then, and he was just laughing. He thought that was the greatest thing. He thought that was so crazy. But um, so I did that for a while, and different things came up on the commission. I, maybe we'll go into some of them later. Um, but um, one of the things was, at that time, the city had a jail. And when people were recalcitrant, they would take all their clothes away from them. Oh. And somebody went to a lawyer and said, hey, this is cruel and unusual punishment. So I go to a meeting, and there's a closed meeting, and I've got 20 people in the room, and the talk is, how do we get out of this thing? And then I said, there's, how many people this happened to? They said, 21. I said, how many were black? 18. Oh. I said, we got a racial issue here. Oh, you gonna play the race card. I said, yeah, I'm gonna play the race card. And we started to look at that. And but I could see that I'm alone here. I've only got about maybe two other people out of here who really want to talk about this. So anyhow, it ended up that they they took care of it. They didn't do that anymore, and eventually they closed the jail. But I learned something from that. And I called um, the people that had been working with me, and I said, listen, I have to talk to you guys every week because I can't get isolated here. You guys have to keep me on track or else I'm going to be thinking in a different way. And, and we did, um, and, and that helped me a lot. Oh, wow, great. Um, so the living wage thing, so coming back to that as a major issue related to poverty, and I know sometimes you vote against some things that people would think would help uh, alleviate poverty. Yeah. So clearly you have another vision in mind around what would alleviate poverty here in Kalamazoo. Wow. You know, um, I'm working on this right now. I met day before yesterday with two librarians and I'm looking at what have other cities done in the country to alleviate poverty. And um, we're not getting too far in this. But my vision is this, that the real answer is a national answer, that really it's the economic system that is the problem. Mm -hmm. And we have to change the economic system in the country. And that's why you and I were both members of the Democratic Socialists of America, and I still am. <laughs> but in the meantime, we have to do what we can do right now in this city. And so we have to push the levers that we can. I think that what has to happen in the city is that we have to develop a plan. I'll, I'll give you an example. The University of Michigan now has a, um, a, a division within this university called Poverty Solutions. And they're working with the city of Detroit. And what they did with the city of Detroit was they met with people that are experiencing poverty. And they said, what, what, 
what would help you? How do, we, how do you think we could get out of this? And they said, we didn't do that first. The first thing we did, they've already told us. There's been all these meetings. We had to go through and look at all these different meetings about what people said need to get out of poverty. And they did that. And then they talked to people that work with them, the social workers and the other people that are mental health workers. So what do you think? And out of that, they came up with an idea about here's the steps forward. And then they had um, uh, a, a meeting, uh, what do you call it, that when you get a group of people, focus groups, mm -hmm. from people in the community and the other, and they said, okay, this is what we're hearing, is this right? And from that, they looked at, these are the main issues. And then they said, okay, what are the best practices that we find around the country in these different things? And then they acted on it. And I think that's what we have to do mm -hmm. in the city. And we haven't done that. We're doing two-way streets. <laughs> we just put $6 million into planning for two-way streets. We're not putting anything like that into reducing poverty in the city and until we do. I think there's some great things happening mm -hmm. in the city. We're doing some great stuff around childcare. We're mm -hmm. doing some great stuff around housing. We're doing, but we don't have a unified plan. And until right. we get to that, we're not going to get it. Kalamazoo could be a national model. We have the resources here. We're small enough. We have um, uh, benefactors here who are willing to put up money. We have a university here mm -hmm. who should be partnering more with this community. And I think that's what's got to happen. So until that happens, I'm going to take every chance I get to kind of put issues on the table. The first meeting that I went to as a city commissioner, the superintendent of schools was there. And it was a woman, and I can't think of her name right now. And as I was going in, I said to her, hey, why don't we start a communities and schools program? Hmm. And she said, let's do it. Great, great. So, we went to Pat Di Giovanni, and, who was the city manager at that time, and we did, we started it. And um, then we got somebody who knew how to do this, which certainly wasn't me, and we were able to um, um, put together, Pam Kingry mm -hmm. put together a wonderful plan, and now the Communities and Schools program is doing tremendous things in the city that are just wonderful, the stuff they're doing. But, being on the city commission gives me a chance to influence policy. It also gives me a platform mm -hmm. so that I can raise consciousness about the issues that are going on. Okay, so you're doing great work on the city commission. We'll probably come back to that again. But, but at some point you decided uh, national politics is critical as well. So I'm going to throw my hat in the ring and try to <laughs> win a seat in Congress. So, a former student of mine, um, Joe, I can't even think Hover. of it. Hover. He came to me and said, listen, uh, there's a, a, a congressional election coming up next year, and nobody's going to run against Upton. you got to run. I said, no, I ain't going to run. I don't want to do that. That's no. And he said, oh, you got to run. So he kept that to me, and I said, okay, I'll run if you'll be my campaign manager. So Joe said, okay, okay. So then he quit his job, <laughs> and now he's got kids. And now, five, five of them. <laughs> at that time, he ended up five, thank God. Now i got to raise money so that Joe's kids don't starve. And, and I'm terrible at that. I'm terrible at that. So anyhow, um, we started organizing. And of course, Fred had been in there 20 some years by now, and the chances were thin. But we said, hey, we're going we're gonna to go as if we're going to win. We're going to win. That's it. So what, what we tried to do, we said, look, we're going to win. We're going to fight to win. If we don't win, we're going to use this to raise consciousness about the issues. Mm -hmm. So um, we were able to get Fred to debate us a couple times, four times, actually. And every time we did, the place was packed. Um, and we were able to raise consciousness about those issues and put those issues on the agenda. Um, but
But uh, my relationship with Fred, I think, w is interesting because I'm not going after Fred. I'm going after the policies. Mm -hmm. And so he and I would talk and before the debates. And I would say, listen, I, I really think you're crazy on this, but I'm not going after you. I'm going after this. And he would say, I think you're crazy too, but we're going to talk about the debates. And that's the way we did. That's the way we did. Mm -hmm. It was an, a, a campaign where we focused on issues um, and um, didn't go after each other. Of course, um, we lost badly. I raised, not me, but other people, about $115,000, which I thought was, my God, how did I ever raise that much money? Fred raised $2.3 million. <laughs> For every dollar I spent, he spent 34. Wow. And um, yeah, so we ended up losing. And so then we ran again a second time. <laughs> and then my campaign manager uh, was John Curran, who was just a student at that time. And he had come to my office to talk to me. And the first time I met John, and he, he um, so he was real interested in politics. And I said, you want to run my campaign? He said, what? <laughs> I said, yeah, why don't you run my campaign? So it turned out he was gold. I mean, he worked night and day. And um, we were able to, to, to do some things, but again, we lost bad. But we did our best. It was, it was a district that was difficult for any Democrat to, to win in at that point. And, uh, the, and, and again, I, I think the money issue. Oh, I, I know you mm -hmm. hated, oh. hated, hated trying to raise money and have to go begging to people to give you money. It's just, it's, uh, but it's, but it illustrates the issue of the power of money in uh, pol American politics right. today. Mm -hmm. Right. If you don't, if you don't, aren't capable of getting the big corporate donors and the, you know, the, uh, the big, the big uh, donors to come in uh, and help you raise that $2.3 million, you're probably not going to have a chance to win, especially in a district where it's, it's slanted toward Republicans anyhow at that time. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but, so I think you were showing that that issue was a critical issue. Yeah. And I, <laughs> but I know how difficult it was for you to try to raise that money. So. Uh, anything else about uh, running for Congress or city that you had, Regina? No, let's okay. move on to the next thing. Um, well, one of the things that uh, we could talk about is uh, critical issues. Oh, yeah, right. yes, right. right. So how did this? How did this program? You talk about well, how it got started. Well, I I came in not in the middle, but you could, you guys had already established it. So Bill O'Brien, bless us all, uh, was the force behind it. And uh, who you had Ronnie Thompson, right? A black uh, African American minister in the community. Right. John who, Spire. John Spire. John Spire. That was your. Campaign that was my manager. campaign manager. Wonderful uh, guy, John. Right. Uh, and uh, Lynn Bartley. Lynn right? Bartley. Uh, how about Rick Stahlhaus? Was he involved in the? Rick first? was. Okay. Rick was. Yes. All right. So you, you, you had a crew here, and you decided you and the name. Who came up with the name? Was that Bill O'Brien or? Um. I can't remember who came up Critical with that. Critical issues, name. alternative views. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, uh, Bartley, I, I think. Lynn, that was, that was okay. Like, okay, good, good, yeah. <laughs> Got a little, uh, our, our <laughs> floor manager chimed in there and let us know that. Um, so, so you guys were already underway. Right. You were already doing this. The, the, you know, this facility was available and people could get trained to uh, run the cameras just much as it's still operating today. It was called the Cable Access Center in those days. Right, not, right. Not public media network yet. Um, and in 2000, so you started in 2001, I believe. And in 2002, uh, it was becoming very apparent that the George W. Bush administration was preparing to invade um, Iraq. And I had been working with Kalamazoo Nonviolent Opponents of War, which you were also a part of. And we had tried to, to get some organizing going on, trying to stop that war from happening. And uh, I'd been doing a lot of research, even sort of on the academic side in terms of state crime. And so you, you guys invited me to come and be a guest. And, and I came and I, uh, you know, talked to And you took it. it all over. Well, you? <laughs> thank God. Thank well, God you did. We, well, we, we wanted talked. you to. <laughs> well, at the end of that time, we said, well, we didn't really get a chance to get into all the issues. Come back and we'll do a part two. Uh, 
part twos were in, in vogue even then. So I came back and we did a part two, and I said, well, you know, come back again. And then after the third time, he ah, said, just, just keep coming. You're going to be one of the regulars. Now. And unfortunately, Ronnie Thompson's health took a, a bad turn at that point, and he wasn't able to continue on the show. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, so I, I joined in, and uh, Lynn was the host in those days. And, yeah, right. Uh, and Bill Bill O'Brien was uh, our, our our driving force behind the scenes yes. there. Yes. Yes. Uh, and then after after Bill passed away, we had a slight hiatus with the program, and then thank goodness uh, our great crew that we have today, uh, Daniel Smith and Larry Mahana and Bob Kilday and John Provencher came along, and we were able to uh, resurrect the show and get get back on the air. But uh, but you were p part of that early. So can you think, what was the original thinking about doing a cable access or just another platform to uh, raise consciousness, right? Yeah, we thought we could do that. And we particularly, we would talk about issues that were right in the public sector today. And when, when things began to develop around um, Iraq, that then it seemed more and more essential that we do that. And you were in by that time. and. And I thought that we were able to use that to mobilize people for rallies and for mm. raising consciousness. We had guests on here yeah, that yeah. were very, very helpful, I thought, in showing the folly of what was going on in, in the planning. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember, but when Bush gave the uh, State of the Union address in January of two th uh, 2003, and they were really ramping up the plans for the invasion, which would happen a, a couple months later, but uh, we decided we had to respond. And so we arranged with Bill to come in and we, we it wasn't a normal critical issue no. show, but we basically, here's our response to the State of the Union last night. Here's what the president said. Here's our response to that. Uh, here's why that was wrong. Here's, here's the evidence about this. And so we, we tried to, uh, you know, yes. counteract. Take them uh, on. Right, uh, right. You know, yeah. and, and of course it dramatically changed the country's view of the word. <laughs> um, but, but nonetheless, it, it was important, I think, to, right. there, there were so many lies being told about the weapons of mass destruction and the involvement of Saddam Hussein with the 9-11 terrorists, absolutely. things that were absolutely false, just completely uh, uh, lie, outright lies. Yeah. And so we felt that we had to kind of counter uh, some of those lies. and. We uh, eventually did not stop the war from happening, but uh, we, we gave it our best effort. And, and that's where Kalamazoo Nonviolent Opponents of War came in. Right, right. You were, uh, so I, I can, so, so there were a number of different strands that came together to form KNOW. Gene and Joe Gump, uh, you know, from the Catholic Peace Movement, the very strong Catholic Peace Movement, we could probably talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but they were holding vigils because of the sanctions that were hurting uh, Iraq, and especially Iraqi children. And uh, Tom Small and his wife at that time, Nancy uh, Small, she said for her birthday that year she wanted to stand in front of the federal building and hold a sign against the war. Yeah. And so Tom and Nancy started to do that. And then you and I independently, I remember calling you up saying, hey, we got to do something. So this war is percolating. We got to do some, some kind of organizing. And so um, it was on the first anniversary of 9-11. There was a uh, um, um, session that was held at uh, uh, the Friends Meeting House. Yes. And yes. in the manner of Friends, you know, you sit there and reflect, but then people, after reflecting, some people started to speak up and talk about the issues concerning 9-11 and everything that had happened in the year since then and the war that was clearly impending. And you and I got up and announced, hey, we're going to have an organizational meeting such and such a day. Please come. And we did. Uh, we met at the old Wesley Foundation yeah. uh, on campus, which was still there. It was Joe Gump who came up with the name, said, hey, let's call it Kalamazoo Nonviolent Opponents of War, because the nonviolence part had to be there, the opposition to war had to be there, and uh, so we were off and running. And KNOW just sort of really took off at that point and did some really, really great work uh, in the lead up to the war, trying to oppose the war, and then stayed together as an organization to continue to speak out against militarism and war to this, to this very day. So, and, and we also had, um, you started Peace Week on campus, where we would bring in um, great speakers, wonderful mm -hmm. people, to come and raise consciousness on the campus. And that led to the start of the Peace Center on campus, yeah. where yeah. we had students 
really involved in, in all these kind of social justice issues. So we just kept trying to mobilize as many people as we can to, organ to speak out on all these different issues. I, I gotta tell a quick story. So in the early 80s, I, get, I got really involved in the issue concerning nuclear weapons and uh, uh, my wife and baby son and I went to New York, June 12th, 1982 for the million right. people uh, rally in Central there. Park. And uh, I came back from that and, I, and that fall of 82, I'm, I'm actually starting to do some academic writing about on the sociology of nuclear weapons. And, but I'm thinking we gotta have some kind of big event. The nuclear freeze uh, movement was big at that time. There were lots of really great people in the community working on the nuclear free. So I said, well, we got to have some kind of thing on campus. So I said, well, who could do that? Well, Cooney and Van Hoven, the Dons, <laughs> right? They, they're, they're, they're the leaders. They do, all, they do this kind of stuff. So I, I called up Don and said, hey, we got to, you know, let's do something. Uh, thinking that it was going to be you and Don that would take the lead. Uh, and uh, so we get there and you guys kind of push me out there. Hey, Amber, you're the, you had the idea. You're the one. You get, I mean, we'll help you, but you get out there and you do it. So uh, I, have, I always tell that story because I, don't, I really didn't have the intention of starting to become involved in the way that I was. Yeah. But you guys, uh, you guys said, you know, get out there and take the lead, and I did. And we ended up having a wonderful week. We called it a Celebrate Life, a Week of Education and Action to Prevent Nuclear War. Uh, George McGovern, yep. one of my heroes, came and uh, uh -huh. he gave the keynote address. We had That's all the film series. We uh, we had a march from campus to Bronson Park at the end of the week. It was we raised like seven thousand dollars. We used some of the money to set up a United Campuses uh, to Prevent Nuclear War yep. uh, chapter here from the Union of Concerned Scientists. So, um, yeah, so that was a big issue. Speaking of heroes, we're getting a little short of time here, but I want you to talk a little bit about mm -hmm. who your heroes are. Um, Michael Harrington at the top of the list. Um, mm -hmm. Michael Harrington, amazing guy. Um, he, he, he was a social worker in St. Louis, came to New York, worked with uh, Dorothy Day at the, um, at, at the Catholic Worker, and organized the Democratic Socialists of America, mm -hmm. which um, Michael, his analysis was, hey, we have to be realistic. We need um, a different kind of an economic system. We need a socialist system here. But we're not going to get that by just screaming and shouting, we need a different kind of a system. We've got to get involved in the system as it is. So what we're going to do is we're going to form an organization called the Democratic Socialists of America. And we're going to be in the Democratic Party. The left wing of the Democratic Party. Left wing of the Democratic Party. And we're going to push them as far to the left as we can. And that was his strategy and, and that's how he lived his life. Um, you know, we brought him here to speak. Yep. He was wonderful. I'll never forget. Uh, I met him at the airport and from the time I met him until I left him off at 10 o'clock that night, he didn't stop talking. He, <laughs> we, we had a news conference on campus. I took him over to K College and he did a presentation there. Um, he said one thing. He said, I'm going to be on CBS News tonight, and I need to be alone for that time. So he did. I picked him up. After that, he gave a presentation on campus, and then we were going to do a fundraiser after that for the local DSA group, and I said, Mike, that's enough. You did enough. He said, oh, no. We're going over here. We're going to talk to these people. Mm -hmm. So we went over there. Finally, about 10.30, I dropped him off at the airport. I said, what time's your plane losing? He says, Don, don't you worry about it. I got it. And he got himself to the airport and get out of here. <laughs> I'll tell you one more story about Michael Harrington. The last time I saw Michael was, um, I used to go every year to a Socialist Scholars Conference in New York City, and a couple thousand people would show up. So I sh went there, and Mike had developed cancer of the throat. He lost about 50 pounds. And um, he was in bad shape. He gave three talks that weekend. Wow. He was still writing a column for the newspaper. Mm -hmm. And writing a book. And he wrote a book. Two months later, he yeah, died. Yeah. Wow. So he was one. Certainly Mandela. Okay. Mandela, top of the line, king for sure. But then other people. Prexy Nesbitt is a guy out of Chicago who was one of the top five anti apartheid organizers. And um, he's still around, still organizing. He and I talk a lot. Um, 
he, he, he'd be one of my guys too. So some of those guys, Dorothy right. Day, which yeah. she was there for. Yeah. All right. Um, I, I have one quick comment that I know Regina's mm -hmm. got an announcement to make, but uh, I was gathering signatures for you one time for one of your elected runs, <laughs> and somebody said, Cooney, uh, he's stuck in the 60s. <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah. And I thought that was a good thing. He thought it was terrible. <laughs> but uh, again, I think what you've demonstrated with the discussion here is the way in which those issues that motivated you, the issues concerning social justice and peace back in the, in the 60s when you or first working as a priest in New York and on to Philadelphia still uh, are occurring today. So we only have two minutes left, and I know, Regina, you've got an announcement about something yeah, else that's going to feature. Exactly. Professor Cooney here. Yeah, so you know, thank you for sharing all your stories and all the people you're connected with and who you've impacted. But there are more people who want to hear from you and talk with you and get your advice. So we have partnered with my church, Unitarian Universalist Community Church in Portage, to feature you as a Thoughtful Thursday speaker on Thursday, August 17th at 7 p.m. on Zoom. And so we're inviting our audience. We know you all have questions and you want to talk more with Don to attend this event. So to register for this event, you can go to the website at uucommunitychurch.org, register for the event, and you will get the link to the Zoom meeting with Don. And we get to learn more from him and ask more questions um, and continue this great work that you have been doing. So thank you so much for all you've done. Thanks for giving me a chance mm. to talk to people. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've gone two hours now, and I, I have a list here, and I didn't get to everything <laughs> on my list, to be honest. Uh, so maybe we'll, we'll weave <laughs> some of these things back in and some other uh, regular programs. Uh, uh, one thing, just very quickly, I know uh, Bobby Kennedy, you would probably like to talk about Bobby Kennedy in terms of, I know you frequently quote him and, and MLK. Uh, but. Uh, Lots to cover, but we, uh, uh, we're running out of time for today. Thank you, Don. This has been wonderful Thank to you. have Thank you sit you. down and talk about all these issues. Being a witness to history, as you say, I think that's a very apt way to put it and, and what, a, what a history it has been. Uh, Thank you for joining us. Please come back again on uh, Critical Issues, Alternative Views.